All right. So my name is Luc Trudeau. I'm going to introduce to you uh, Chroma from Luma, the version that we decided to put in AV1. Um, I have a link here if you want to get the slides. This is Chroma. You're not going to see it well. It was designed that way. So if you go on this link, you can look at the image I'm showing you. Probably on your laptop, it's going to look better. There's also a lot <coughs> of uh, links in there, the work we've done with uh, AV1 that you can go check out. So probably better if you can follow along in the slides. Uh, feel free to reuse anything that's in these slides. Be happy. All right, so uh, what is Chroma from Luma? Right? I'm here to introduce to you that, if you don't remember it from the Dala talks that were given prior years. Um, so basically, it's an intracoding tool. So intracoding tool, as you all know, is a coding tool that has no uh, dependencies on previously reconstructed frames. Uh, that's very useful. And uh, this is a particular variant of a coding tool because it's only available for chroma planes. And it turns out that AV1 was perfect for this because it has a UV mode for some reasons. That means that it has its own mode for chroma planes, uh, for chroma intra blocks, and it has another mode for luma intra blocks. So we can fit CFL right into there. So we thought, hey, built in. All we need to do is add CFL two weeks and we're done, right? So it's been a year. <laughs> but I'm getting there, okay? Um, it's been adopted, right? But it's not on by default, so that's really cool. We got we got them to approve something, even though it's not on. Uh, but we're working on making it turn on by default. So the results you saw before, uh, shown by Netflix, probably didn't have it in there, but soon, soon it will be there. So what does it do? Okay, it'll take reconstructed Luma pixels. And it will use this as input to create a prediction. And contrary to other CFLs, so maybe you heard of the Thor coder from Cisco, which also has a CFL. You may have heard of LM mode, which was mysteriously disappeared from HEVC before it was released. But uh, they also had uh, CFL-ish like uh, algorithms. But the difference is they would imply the parameters, and we just signaled them, because experiments in Della showed that that would work really well. So we decided to do that. All right, so in action, all right? This is a frame, okay? We're looking at a block inside of a frame, and I take, so we use the same Luma, okay? And we try to reconstruct the prediction. So this would be DC pred inside the chroma plane. So I combine both chroma planes, I measure DC pred, so DC pred are the neighbors, right? Actually, the neighbors here. We take the average, we put that there, and here's what you get with CFL. So again, if you have this on your laptop, it's probably easier, but you can see that there's a bit more blue in the sky. Turns out there's a bit more blue in the black, but you know, it's chroma from Luma. You wanted chroma, we delivered. <laughs> All right, and we signal two parameters here, okay? So that, that's basically how that works, but let's break it down. So there's three steps to getting that prediction. First, you wanna compute your Luma AC contribution. Second, you want to scale your chroma planes individually, and you want to add the chroma DC pred. So that's really interesting because you're going to need that anyway. So you take your chroma DC pred and you add that over it. So you have to compute it for another mode, so we get it almost for free. All right, so I showed you before, compute AC contribution at step one, and you were like, what? What's this AC contribution thing? Um, basically, um, the Dala version of CFL was done in the frequency domain. We tried that. Uh, it was already hard enough when there was four transforms in AV1. Now there's 16. That's the point where I decided, like I was in that presentation when they were showing the 16 ones. I'm like, no, I'm not going to try and map from one prediction domain to the other. So we just decided to switch to the pixel domain. But we really like the fact that CFL really shines for the AC part on the coefficients. So it turns out you can do that in the spatial domain just by subtracting out the average because the DC is kind of like the average. So that's what you do. There's an initial step if you're using 422 or 420. You'll want to subsample because your Luma is going to be bigger. You're going to have more pixels in your Luma than you're going to have in your chroma, so you subsample. And then afterwards, you compute the average, in this case, 202, and you'll subtract that, and you'll get a value that looks like this, right? Again. Probably easier if you have a laptop to see that, but you can see a bit of the information there. So that's our AC contribution part, and we feed that into our next step. And then our next step, we decode 
the uh, parameters that we signaled inside the bitstream. So we take those, and we so one for each plane. We scale them, uh, sorry, we multiply them, and that gives us the scaling here, which you can see. Final step. Oh, okay. Well, so you have your scaling, and then the original Chroma DC Fred that you had, you just add those together, and voila, TFL. So that's what the encoder does. And that's what the, both the encoder and decoder do. We also have the uh, analyzer tool that uh, when you use are we compressed yet, you can look at any run. So anything that the results we showed you uh, yesterday that Tim showed you, you can click on any of the results, any of the video sequence, and you can look at any frame. And you can see all the, the most of the encoder decisions, and we've added support for CFL. So here you can see CFL as the um, kind of cyanish, and you have purple is, uh, doesn't look like purple in this one, but anyway, you have DC pred. So DC pred's taken about 44% of the time. CFL pred is chosen about 17% of the time for this. We see it going around about 15 to 20% that's picked for chroma modes only, of course. So you can see the blocks that are uh, chosen with CFL pred. So it's also very interesting. Other companies, our friends in the Alliance, propose something. So we're slightly better, but I'm, like, I'm not comparing or anything. You know, and they made two more versions of that, and we're still better than all three of them sum together, but not compare. Uh, results. So, um, as I said before, this works with intra images. So, this is great for still images. So, if you're working on a still image codec and you don't want this great chroma tool, like, it'll work really well. And if you're working on video codec, it also works really well. So, on still images, we get about 5% CIED. Uh, Reduction, so okay, what, what is this here? This is BD rate, right? So the area between the curves for different metrics. So your x-axis is the rate and the y-axis is any of the metrics you want. Um, so you can see the values here. Uh, we use CIED 2000 because it is the only metric that combines both Luma and Chroma, and since this is Chroma from Luma, it makes a lot of sense. And also it weighs them in a visually perceptual distance. So the value you're getting is closely resembling to what your eyes would distinguish from the distance. So why is there a Luma PSNR game here? Well, it's pretty easy. It's because we're making better predictions. So better predictions equals less rate. And since I said the x-axis is rate, turns out it costs less, fewer bits to code, right? So when you compare the Luma PSNR to the overall rate, you see a reduction. Um, so, so that helped us in getting this tool adopted because you know, a lot of people in the Alliance think this is a great Luma tool. And yet I'm not going to contradict them. So it also works great for video. It doesn't work as good. And the reason for that, like I said, is because when you go into interframes, uh, you'll have interblocks, which are already really good because they get to use the previous frame, which we don't. Um, but it still stands out. It stands out also very well for screen content coding. And uh, I was also surprised to see that uh, I think Twitch ran some, some tests. And uh, on the Twitch data set, it runs really well. So for CID 2000, it's about 5% reduction of your bit rate for same quality. On uh, the different sequence, you can pick your favorite game or favorite sequence. And you can see the games that you're getting. I think Minecraft is pretty intense. Yeah, 20%. That's, if you go on that link and you look at that, the colors really stand out a lot more. So for gaming, this is turning out to be a really good coding tool. Um, looking at some of the sequence in the analyzer, like the uh, GTA sequence, basically what's going on is you have a lot of fast movement when the car is going fast, and there's these shadow areas, so motion estimation kind of breaks when you have shadows because they have the constant illumination assumption, and when shadows obviously don't do that when they cross the shadow. So basically everything that comes out of the shadow we see as CFL or DC bread, but you, most often it's about half and half, but you know, so very useful for games where there's a lot of fast motion and where motion estimation kind of breaks up. So what's next for us? Um, CFL is about 1% of the 13 days per second of encode, so not, 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 probably less than that because that was on the four day per second encode. Um, but we still want to optimize it because it would be awesome if it could be used in other codecs, and we think that it would help a lot if there's already optimized code to, to use this. Uh, we also plan on adding 
422 support. Um, we already have 444 and 4420. We currently also have high bit depth that's under review. It's coming soon. Um, we wanted to do CFL and enter, so if this can be done. So CFL enter, not to be confused with CFL in intra blocks inside inter frames. What I mean here is CFL in inter blocks in inter frames. So basically, you would have a motion vector, it would point to something, you'd take the chroma from that as your starting point, and then you'd feed in parameters and build another prediction similar to what I explained before. Uh, but that's going to be another codec because we only have 31 days and I still need to do this. It turns out I've only written not much of this and I'm not really good at writing it. So that's why I think you guys are good at this. <laughs> Somebody could teach me or help me out. Uh, 422 support, we have it coming, so I just need to update the patch because everything changes so quick in this codec. Um, there's a design doc, also a quick tiny URL if you want to go look at that. It's 18 pages. It also has a fact section because I get a lot of questions, so I keep track of them. Um, so do, do, do check my stuff out. If you like it, contribute, put it in your own codec. I think this is great. Not enough love for the, for the Chroma from Luma. So thank you very much. Questions? That means a perfect talk. Oh no, it wasn't a perfect talk. Okay. <laughs> so most intra predictors they work best at small block sizes, right? Uh, is that true for this one also? Um, so like, are you talking specifically from CFL? Yeah. Okay. So like LM mode in HEVC had was capped at uh, eight byte, I think. Um, we decided to let it go all the way because I don't like this thing of mapping kind of features to block sizes. And we, like you saw in the analyzer image, we still get some bigger blocks, like big flatter blocks, also performing very well. So I think it gives us constant gains over all the block sizes. Uh, but again, it's content dependent. 